So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May Mary, seed of wisdom, be a sure haven for all who search for wisdom, the sure and final goal of all true knowing. May our journey into wisdom be freed of every hindrance by the intercession of the one who, in giving birth to the truth and treasuring it in her heart, has shared it forever with all the world. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I uh, know for some of you it's been an off day, but for some of you, you've been being yakked at for quite a bit, so I appreciate you coming out for more. Um, all right, so today I want to talk about ontological poverty, a very precise term that captures our situation as creatures. We do not independently possess the means to begin to exist or to continue in existence. Creation is viewed in our tradition as the gift of gifts, the expression of God's infinite generosity. But for many of our contemporaries, the idea of creatureliness is something to be resisted as a threat to our dignity. Contemporary philosopher Thomas Nagel speaks of a fear of religion which he thinks is common among intellectuals. He writes, I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true, and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. What is the root of this cosmic authority problem, as Nagel himself calls it? When he says, I don't want the universe to be like that, what does he mean by that? Clearly, Nagel wants the universe not to be created, not to owe its existence and order to a power beyond the universe. In his most recent book, Mind and Cosmos, Nagel points, posits that in order for mind to have developed in human beings, it must somehow have been present from the very beginning of the universe. A successful understanding of the universe will, Nagel thinks, need to show, quote, how the natural order is disposed to generate beings capable of comprehending it, and will allow us to see that, again quote, each of our lives is a part of the lengthy process of the universe gradually waking up and becoming aware of itself. To Nagel's credit, he has consistently resisted reductive materialism, the most common route to denying any authority beyond the universe itself. He proposes instead a naturalism which maintains that the universe is self-sufficient and somehow bears within itself from the beginning the latent active potency to develop not only materially but also somehow mentally. But even if this were true, he would still be faced with the metaphysical question, where did all that latent active potency come from? Anything which manifests composition of act and potency, which Nagel's pos posited universe certainly does, is still subject to the principle of su sufficient reason and requires a cause beyond itself. Complexifying the potency of the universe itself is interesting and makes for really cool science fiction, but it ignores the most basic metaphysical question. Why would Nagel do that? He himself has answered the question. In order to avoid even the possibility of an authority over the cosmos itself, certain lines of questioning are simply being ruled out of bounds in advance. Edward Faser, who I can't wait to hear in two weeks, points out that Nagel is unusually open about the fact that his atheism is rooted in wishful thinking. The majority of academics in the English-speaking world are less self-aware. 
like a teenager who has learned to yell hater to shut down any difficult conversation, too many academics have learned to treat the possibility of God as something embarrassing, taken seriously only by uneducated people. That taboo is enforced socially and its consequences are far-reaching. As Chesterton probably didn't say, he who does not believe in God will believe in anything. And the anything has arrived in spades. In the last superstition, Phaser lists some of the things that have become thinkable for the intellectual elites in our terribly grown up, no need for an authority beyond the ourselves world. Professional ethicists arguing for infanticide, euthanasia, bestiality, necrophilia, same-sex marriage, animal rights superseding human rights, and that was the list Phaser made in 2008. In the nine years since, we have learned that biological sex has nothing to do with gender and that it's perfectly reasonable for a father of seven to suddenly realize that he is not a man after all and settle instead on an identity as a six-year-old girl. What is going on here? How can any responsible person suggest that we celebrate these things? And how in the world did the rainbow, the sign of God's promise that he would never again use his restart button on the earth, how did this sign come to be adopted by the purveyors of this madness? It's as though they are saying, we'll push the restart button ourselves. We will destroy the people of the earth in order to remake man in no image at all. A lot of things are tangled up here. Things are separated that belong together, and our response to the ensuing unraveling has been to tie things up in every which way. Soul has been separated from body. Power has been separated from teleology. Indoctrination has displaced education. Expressing a judgment out loud has become hate speech. Freedom has become license. We are in such a mess that it's very difficult to figure out where to start. In fact, I started this paper at least six times. <laughs> but I think what's at the root of it all is that human dignity and human creaturehood have become mutually exclusive notions for the modern mind. Dignified creaturehood is now an oxymoron. Fidelity to a law not of one's own devising indicates immaturity, a failure to reach an adult state. The natural law, which St. Thomas understood as a great gift to man, now is perceived as a burden imposed from without, and voluntary subjection to that law, a cooperation with our own humiliation. As so often is the case, our tradition holds a both and which has been confused into an either or. As creatures, we are both utterly indebted and entirely endowed. We have been effected by the action of the creator, but by that very act endowed with our own efficacy. Creation is God's project, but not his puppet. The catechism puts it this way, God has not willed to reserve to himself all exercise of power. He entrusts to every creature the functions it is capable of performing according to the capacities of its own nature. The catechism goes on immediately to articulate the principle of subsidiarity as one that we are to follow in imitation of God's respect for secondary causes. And if you want to talk more about that in the question and answer, I think there's a lot of ways that are fruitful for us to think about that. Our many, many failures in subsidiarity make it clear that we have a very hard time acting as though there can really be more than one real power at a time. Given our failures in this regard, it is not hard to understand that people would extend to God 
the mistrust earned by human beings. So we need to do two things. First, we need to act more like God so that people can find God's generosity more plausible. That's everybody's assignment for the rest of our lives. <laughs> Second, we have to help people think more clearly about God as he is, not as we fail to represent him. The both and of creaturely indebtedness and efficacy is mirrored in the creator's imminence and transcendence. St. Thomas addresses the mode of God's imminence early in the Prima Pars, asking very simply whether God is in all things. Thomas answers that God is in all things in the way that an agent, an efficient cause, is present to, inest, that upon which it works. So, Thomas says, just as the light of the sun illuminates the air for as long as the air is being illuminated, the source of our being makes us be for as long as we be. The sun's presence to the air can come and go. It affects the air, but does not effect it. But when the sun is illuminating the air, or in my house, all the dust in the air, think about what an intimate relationship that is. The sunlight is right there, right with the air. The creator's presence to the creature is even more radical, not only affecting the creature, but effecting it. Thomas says, essay is that which is innermost to anything and most profoundly present to everything. Hence, it must be that God is in everything and innermostly, intimate. If someone thinks of creation as an imposition from outside the creature, he is making a metaphysical error. Existence is within the creature, not without. Instead of saying, God created me without my consent, it actually makes more sense to say, God created me and my consent. My capacity to give or withhold permission is itself God's gift. And I have it precisely because he gave it to me as my own, as a being other than himself. Resentment of God is actually a manifestation of the fact that the gift he's given me is real. If I were simply an extension of God, not authentically other than God, I could not resent God. In creation, God gives finite being not only existence, but order. The intelligi intelligibility of the universe itself cannot be accounted for otherwise. This is not an order maintained from outside, but one that arises integrally from within creation itself. It is not the universe being manipulated. It's the universe being itself. A version, it seems to me, of the integral universe that Nagel thinks a successful theory will show. But Nagel wants that mindful universe to somehow arise on its own. He is failing to process the existential situation that John Paul Sartre so resolutely articulated. Either there is a God who creates and thereby orders the universe, or there is no authentic order, and the only appropriate realistic response is nausea. Joseph Pieper refers to this as Sartre's meritoriously clarifying radicalism. In creation, God causes something authentically other than himself. He did not have to do that, but he willed to do so. I am now utterly indebted to my creator, and yet the gift he has given me is now my own. This is true for every creature, and even more acutely true for the rational creature, who receives not only existence and order, but the capacity to become aware of those gifts. All of creation is subject to God's ordering, the eternal law. But as a rational creature, I have the capacity to participate in my own ordering. Like every other creature, I am God's project but I have been given the capacity to cooperate in that project. 
to understand my own ordering and that of the world around me, and to a lesser extent, to assent, assent to that order freely. Pope Benedict says, in contrast to the animals, our life is not simply laid out for us in advance. What it means for us to be human beings is for each one of us a task and an appeal to our freedom. While both scripture and metaphysics assure me that you are not God, you did not make yourself, you do not rule the universe, because of the gift of reason and free will, I can rule myself and choose to act in accord with my own given nature. To refuse to acknowledge the order given in creation is to deliberately blind ourselves. A hearty non serviam may earn me some knowing nods from my peers, but it also makes me unable to know the truth of things or to order my own actions in a way conducive to my own happiness. This is exactly the state of nausea Sartre points to. If I reject a mindful creator who orients me toward my own fulfillment, the result is not freedom, but disorientation, a compass that points everywhere at once. Pieper paraphrases Sartre, calling this the kind of freedom to which man is not called, but condemned, and which is almost identical with despair. Although the teenager in every one of us wishes we could do whatever we want, whenever we want, in our maturity, we realize that that isn't actually freedom at all. Radical autonomy, freedom for freedom's sake, is an emperor with no clothes. People act like it's terrific, but there's a very deep unease covered over with frantic activity or medicated relaxation. In our fippies, we have contrasted freedom as autonomy with freedom for excellence. But in preparing this talk, I've decided that it might be better to call the mature freedom, freedom to be ourselves. It's the freedom that comes with acknowledging who we really are. Creatures willed to be and to have a certain order by an infinitely wise and loving God. The call to excellence is at its root, a call to become more and more fully ourselves. Far from a threat to my dignity, my identity, it's a call for me to fully live my own dignity, my own identity. Just as the order of the universe is given to it to be its own, my dignity, my, my identity, my integrity, all these are both given to me and owned by me. God wants us to be and to be ourselves. Acknowledging our dependence on him is not a humiliation, but a realistic appraisal of the situation. And if we really understand what it means for an infinite being who needs nothing to, be des to desire to be in community with puny beings like us, even knowing exactly how much trouble we will be, we realize, gosh, he must really be crazy about us. He wants us to exist. Sometimes we can barely put up with each other, but he continuously renews, reapproves the existence of even the most irritating <coughs> among us. Right? Credit card that just doesn't expire. <laughs> Our dependence on God is a direct result of his love for us. God says, I want you to be, and to be yourself. The approval that we're seeking on Facebook, showing off for our friends, is nothing compared to the radical thumbs up, the man do I like you, manifest by our continued existence. When people live like they really believe in their own creaturehood, they manifest a gift of the Holy Spirit called fear of the Lord. Once when I was giving a talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, an older woman got very agitated 
and insisted that because we now understand that all fear is psychologically harmful, we should not use the word fear at all in thinking about our relationship with God. That was a very interesting conversation. But this is another e or, either or that has degenerated from a both and. The truth is that fear can be both good and bad. Advocates of radical autonomy think that all fear is bad because it represses my choices. Actually, a good parent teaches her children to be afraid of fire in order to protect them and help them to protect themselves from getting burned. And I'm still afraid of fire and that's still protecting me. Fear is bad when it impedes our acting appropriately. Fear is good when it helps us to act well, to act in accord with the integrity of our own being. St. Thomas says fear of the Lord is a form of filial fear, which is so named because it is the kind of fear a flourishing child would have with regard to disobeying a truly excellent parent. It's not that the child fears punishment, but that he knows his father loves him and that the rules his father makes for him are good. So he does not want to disobey those rules and wound himself and his relationship with his father. Now, as we know, human fathers and mothers do not always merit the kind of confidence that this idealized flourishing child would have. But that is the flawed side of the analogy. God, as the author of our existence and our order, is the only one whose rules we can be supremely confident are always to be followed as for our good. Far from manifesting weakness, Adhering to God's or the, to the Creator's ordering is a sure sign of wisdom, of knowing reality as it actually is. Thomas says filial, filial fear is the beginning of wisdom in the sense that it is the first effect of wisdom. For since the regulation of human life by the divine law belongs to wisdom, in order to make a beginning, man must first of all revere God and submit himself to him. For the result will be that in all things he will be ruled by God. Filial fear, Thomas says, does not decrease as we grow in charity, but rather it increases. The more vividly we respond to God's love for us, the more averse we are to anything that would disrupt that relationship. The more convinced we are that this would not be good for us. Thomas follows a line of thought already established by the fathers of the church, according to which filial fear is perfected in the blessed, just as charity is. And in heaven, filial fear continues, as, in Augustine's word, a fear that holds fast to a good which we cannot lose. In his discussion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Thomas reflects on how each gift is connected to a particular beatitude. Given the connection between acknowledgement of our ontological poverty and the gift of fear of the Lord, it isn't surprising that Thomas connects this gift to the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poverty of spirit is the correct affective response to the reality of our ontological poverty. Thomas says, now from the very fact that a man subjects himself to God, it follows that he ceases to seek greatness either in himself or in another, but seeks it only in God. Poverty of spirit denotes either the emptying of a puffed up and proud spirit, right? I learned the word ex exinanitio. It's a really cool word, it means emptying. Uh, as Augustine says, or the renunciation of worldly goods, which is done in spirit, that is by one's own will, through the instigation of the Holy Spirit, as Ambrose and Jerome say. I'd like to reflect on poverty of spirit as the emptying of a puffed up or proud spirit. 
Acknowledging our own creaturehood allows us to be open and receptive to God, to ourselves, and to others. It allows us to be open to our own limitations in a way that the non servium simply can't. It lets us have a sense of humor about ourselves, something the prideful can only feebly imitate. You may have recently noticed. And it enables us to be receptive to both God and our fellow human beings in a way that the prideful can only pretend. When we acknowledge our dependence on God and are able to experience that dependence with the humble dignity of a beloved child, our ability to depend on and be depended on by others also is transformed. Simplistic notions of reciprocity, of keeping count that I'm getting as much as I'm giving, simply fall away in the face of the magnitude of what God has done for each of us. There is no room for pay-as-you-go relationships if we are aware of our own indebtedness. At the same time, a vivid sense of creatureliness helps us to be aware of the capacity each of us has to fall short of what we ought to be. We are less shocked by our own failures and less scandalized by the failings of others when we have our common creatureliness firmly in mind. Awareness of our own dependency forces us to get over wrong-headed notions of self-sufficiency and inoculates us against the sort of pride that looks to help the neighbor but refuses to expose any need of our own. In fact, facing our own dependency can help us to understand what we receive from relationships in which we may at first think that we are primarily giving. Seeing our fellow human beings as having been deliberately called into existence by God helps us to encounter them in a way that expects them to be gifted in themselves and potentially gifts to us. This is true of all the people we encounter, but to take what is the most counterintuitive instance for the modern mind, let us reflect on the fact that through this lens, it is possible to see the profoundly disabled person as potentially, commensurately gifted. If we encounter them expecting only to discover what they are not, which is what we tend to do, we will never appreciate what they are. Right? But when we have a sense of our own creatureliness, it opens us up to seeing the other as a creature who may be very different right, from me, but, but is, is gifted by the same God. Uh, I wanted to just talk about a couple of instances that kind of illustrate that. Um, there's a story that, uh, that was told to me by someone I believed of a woman who had been institutionalized almost her entire life uh, from very near birth because she had a terrible um, cerebral palsy and other sorts of conditions which caused her to not be able to move at all. And it was assumed that she was also cognitively disabled. So by the time this woman was in her 20s, she had always lived in uh, these different institutions. But when she was in her 20s, a nurse uh, who was on her floor um, decided, well, you know, uh, this is sort of boring, and made an alphabet chart for this woman and was going to teach her the letters of the alphabet. So she made this and she, she set the woman's arm up so that she could, with just a little of a elbow assist, move her hand from letter to letter. And so the nurse thinks, okay, so we'll start with A, A, B, B, right? But the woman, as soon as this is all in place, goes straight to the G and then to the E, T, M, E, O, U, T, get me out. Had been completely cognitively aware her whole life, but no one 
had ever imagined that she might be more than her disability. And so she was trapped. So this nurse starts calling everybody in the universe, right? And is able to, to get this woman out. And this woman ultimately, with 24-7 help, ended up living in her own house and not just being incarcerated for her whole life, right? On the other hand, we also encounter people who, who clearly are cognitively disabled, right? And they're not going to really shock us with get me out, right? We've been paying enough attention to be quite confident that that is true. But something that we may not expect to see them in them that I think it would really help us to see is how happily many of them accept their dependence. That the kind of thing that we would chafe at, right, that's, you know, it, oh, it's just not dignified to need to have this other person do this for me. Cognitively disabled people, uh, by and large, do not manifest that kind of resentment, right? Our Rachel is perfectly content to have us take care of her 24-7. <laughs> That doesn't bother her at all. That strikes her as the way things ought to be, right? How much do we have to learn from that, right, about what's going on with us when we refuse to acknowledge the ways in which we need each other, right, or need God? Uh, you may have seen the, the stuff in the news about the survey that was done of people with Down syndrome over the age of 12, I mean, imagine, you know, uh, and I think they were all between 12 and 25. If you just surveyed the, the general population of the United States between the ages of 12 and 25 and asked them, do you like yourself? Are you, are you happy with your family, right? You know, do you think life is worth living, right? Your typical teenager is really going to struggle with that a little bit, right? I know I did, right? But when they surveyed these uh, people with Down syndrome between 12 and 25, their answers were 99%, 97%, and 95% to those three, right? Were very happy with their lives and their situations, right? That's very different from the view of the cognitively disabled that a rigid emphasis on autonomy generates. If you understand freedom as autonomy, then the ability to independently choose and then carry out one's choice, if that's what it means to be free, then the cognitively impaired person is not very free. But if you think of freedom as the freedom to be yourself, these are some of the freest people on the planet. And yet, Prenatal diagnosis of chromosomal abnormalities associated particularly with cognitive disability is greeted with fear and all too frequently results in abortion. Unlike God's, I want you to be, to be and to be you, too many of these littlest among us are told, I don't want you because you will be you. In his book, Reconsidering Intellectual Disability, Jason Reimer Grieg observes, a culture trained in a human telos of eliminating contingency and maximizing choice easily pro projects its own fear of the limitation of creatureliness onto people with intellectual disabilities. In a society that is deeply afraid of death and dependence, People with cognitive impairments embody the suffering inherent in a life not of one's own choosing. Right? But the interesting thing about that is that the, the, we're only frightened of these people in the abstract, <laughs> right? In the particular, right? People tend to respond very warmly to the intellectually disabled, right? It's, it's just when they're not actually present that all that fear is there. The more invested we are in the myth of our own autonomy, the harder it is for us to welcome people who give the lie to that myth, who remind us how very contingent we all really are. And that is precisely what makes, makes them such important prophets for our time. 
living with and caring for the cognitively disabled allows the cognitively able to experience the possibility of a mutuality which is so much more than reciprocity. Ava Fader Kitte, a feminist philosopher who is herself the mother of a disabled child, writes movingly of making the discovery during that, the first months of her baby's life. She recounts that once she and her husband realized their baby was seriously disabled, quote, our worst fear was that her handicap would involve her intellectual faculties. We, her parents, were intellectuals. I was committed to a life of the mind. How was I to raise a daughter that would have no part of this? In my, if my life took its meaning from thought, what kind of meaning would her life have? Yet throughout this time, it never occurred to me to think of her in any other terms than my own beloved child. Her impairment in no way mitigated my love for her. If it had any impact on that love, it was only to intensify it. She was so vulnerable. We did not yet realize how much she would teach us, but we already knew we had learned something. That which we believed we valued, what we, I, thought was at the center of humanity, the capacity for thought, for reason, was not it, not it at all. Through her encounter with her daughter, Kate learned that there was so much more to her own life than her own rationality. Her daughter's incapacity forced her to move out of her narrow comfort zone and realize that there was more to being human than being rational. I've had a similar experience in my own life, right, coming to grips with our Rachel's disability. And I remember in those first few months that I kept realizing there's not going to be a college graduation. There's not going to be a wedding, right? And I hadn't even realized I had been expecting those things until I realized that I was grieving them. <laughs> right? And for some reason, the thing that was hardest for me to get over was that she was never going to read the books I love. <laughs> we were never going to talk about that together. And it was just so hard to accept. But what I've come to see is that our expectation is that the people we love are going to be like us. So our relationship with them is going to be kind of more of the same of what we've had all along. And when it turns out that a loved one is not or is no longer like us in some really important way, there's a grief in that but there's also an incredible expansion of the one who loves, right? To be able to find, okay, well, we're not gonna do that together, so what can we do, right? I had no idea how much satisfaction I could take from singing the same medley of nursery rhymes over and over and over again for 18 years, right? I have never gotten tired of it. Right? I would not have known that about myself, that I would not get bored. That's good to know. Rachel and I have a lot of mutuality, a lot of being together, of being comfortable together, of being happy together, but we have very little reciprocity, where I give something and she gives almost the same in return. Almost no reciprocity. And isn't that exactly like our relationship with our creator? Reciprocity is impossible. I cannot give to him as he gives to me. But that isn't what he wants, and he hasn't spent any time grieving over that, right? He never had that expectation, right? He actually wants me to be puny little me and to be me with him. Pope Benedict writes that to be made in the image of God means to be made for relationality, not mere rationality. 
God's relations with us are marked by a profound respect for us. In our relations with people who depend upon us, it is important for us to image that same respect. The person who is, in, who is poor in spirit, who ceases to seek greatness either in himself or in another, is able to be depended upon without mistaking himself for God, is able to see the other as equally the creature of God, endowed with a nature that must be respected despite the ways in which, in which it might be hidden. The helper who is poor in spirit helps in a way that does not humiliate and moves at the speed of the one helped, never confusing efficiency with care. This is the person who looks to not only helped but be helped by the dependent, never undermining, isolating, or excluding them, but welcoming them. Their example makes it easier for us to believe in our hearts, what we know in our minds, that God loves us and has no interest in our humiliation. That the humbling moments that come our way are gifts to help us understand ourselves better and so better cooperate in the project each one of us is. Pope Benedict puts it this way, human beings can only be healthy when they are true. The Holy Spirit convinces the world and us of sin not to humiliate us, but to make us true and healthy, to save us. That salvation requires that we acknowledge our ontological poverty. In Benedict's words, we can only be saved, that is free and true, when we stop wanting to be God and when we renounce the madness of autonom autonomy and self-sufficiency. Thank you very much.